Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is a partner at Matterhorn Asset Management and an investor with extensive experience in real assets, alternative investments, law, and finance, with particular expertise in precious metals as a wealth preservation instrument. It's Mr. Matthew Pippenberg. It's an honor to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to have you on for a while. So I want to start like I do with all new guests, and that is with the origin story. So how did you first discover investing? How did that lead you to the precious metal space and to where you are at today at Gold Switzerland and Matterhorn Asset Management? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting evolution. It was kind of a uninvited guest into Wall Street in the sense that I started out as an attorney and I joke I practiced for about 10 minutes and um, I got a phone call from a very, very good friend then and now, my roommate in high school, roommate in college, uh, who was working um, an institutional sales desk during the dot-com bubble in the late 90s and had done very, very, very well and decided to start his own hedge fund. And this was during the, the peak hysteria of the dot-com bubble of the late 90s into 2000. And he invited me to come in and, and, and join this hedge fund. I joked with my wife, I didn't know a stock from a bond. I, I was really learning, it was a trial by fire, but it was a period of time of just extraordinary bubble asset formation. I knew enough to know that we were in interesting markets and it was kind of a trial by fire, but we were very lucky, not very smart. Again, this is in your late twenties, um, not really trained on a bond desk at a, at a major bank or at a, at a prop desk at Goldman. We came out of law and finance, had some money from friends, family and fools and got involved in some pre IPOs, which at the time were like the Bitcoins and Ethereum's at 10 bucks. Everyone was was issuing IPOs and we got into a pre IPO through some contacts at Goldman Sachs. So we were not smart. We were lucky. And without, you know, it's the story that no one wants to hear. We were those idiot young guys in the late 90s who were making silly money on an IPO. And for a year, we had to sit on that stock because of 145B restrictions. We couldn't sell. And I remember just watching that stock go from pennies to dollars to tens of dollars to hundreds of dollars and watching that bubble on the NASDAQ get bigger and bigger. So I, I really learned about bubbles and exaggerated PE ratios and exaggerated confidence and central bank support in the first real bubble that I experienced or traded. It was fascinating to watch. The moment that stock came off restriction, I was out of there. And um, I learned to uh, take your profits when you can take them. And then I became and we became responsible for lucky money. And so you trans we kind of transitioned from being hedge fund managers to lottery ticket winners to family office directors because our own money or other people's money became something we could kind of combine and then get access to other hedge funds who were frankly smarter than us. And over that time, I went from being a, a you know, a CIO and a general counsel to eventually a managing director of a multifamily office, which was a new family office. And by that point, you're fast forwarding about six or seven years, I was far more uh, knowledgeable by accident in how markets work, how bubbles work, how central banks work, how asset classes work. And at that point, we were at a family office which had billions to allocate. And I was a managing director of that family office in charge of the research. So we got to sit down with the best, the worst, I guess say the good, the bad, and the ugly of the alternative investment space. Mostly uh, long, short, long short equity funds, some multi-strat funds, some credit funds, um, some private equity, VC. But that was when you had this massive amount of AUM, obviously not all mine, just a lot of families combined, a massive amount of AUM to, to sit down with the portfolio managers and leading analysts. It's some, some of the best and some of the worst uh, portfolio managers, again, from New York to Chicago to London. Um, it was a lot of, I would say, the best education I ever had as an, as, as an investor as opposed to a manager. And I got to talk to some brilliant credit managers. I learned that the bond market is the thing. I learned that bond alumni, those who understood the bond market, and understood spreads and understood rates, uh, usually were the best investors, not just with bonds, but even with equities, because there is a direct correlation to bond market support and equity tailwinds. And um, I think that's during that period of really investing, I was far more educated than I was as a manager, because like I said, we were just lottery ticket winners, winners in our late 20s, the guys you love to hate during the dot-com bubble. Um, but when you become more responsible for your own or other people's money, you're far more uh, aware of risk than you are of just return. Although I've had 
colleagues that would always pound the fist for return, return, return. And maybe it was the legal mentality of the lawyer in me. I was always thinking risk, risk, risk. I joke. It's like that scene uh, in the great short where he, he asked that guy, so where do you F me? Where do you screw me? Where am I going to get screwed in the CDS purchase? I was always looking, where's the risk? And I always allocated to the managers who opened a meeting with where they saw the flaws or the risks in their portfolio, as, a, as opposed to just promising projections. Most people want to hear projections. I understand that. But I was much more cautious knowing how lucky and how sporadic and how capricious risk asset markets really are and how supported they are by central bank policy. I wanted to hear managers who've been through drawdowns and manage risk well, who didn't just start their fund after 2008 or after 2001, who actually went through serious market corrections and protected risk and hedged. Most hedge funds are just levered long funds. Um, so I learned to think about risk a lot more. And then as I kind of got more and more educated in the, in the risk asset markets, I started thinking about wealth preservation as part of my risk thinking. And if you measure a portfolio or even a checking account in dollars or euros or yen or yuan or, yuan or whatever, for me, it was obviously dollars. What really is the value of that dollar? And I started to think beyond just, you know, VAR and mean reversion and, you know, sharp ratios and maximum drawdowns. I was thinking about well, whatever money I have, whatever money I make or we make as, a, as an office, what really is the value of that money? And of course, well, the U.S. dollar is the most powerful horse in the glue factory. You're fine. The U.S. dollar is great. And I started to look at the behavior and the definition and the meaning of money and what an unchaperoned versus a chaperone dollar really looks like. What is fiat money? And that was a very slow process, but became less and less dramatic and sensational and more and more obvious. So no matter how complex your understanding is of different strategies in the markets and whether it's using options or puts or inverse ETNs or ETFs, or whether it's coming up with the very best hedge fund managers that you can get into on a two and 20 or one in 10 structure, all of that was important. But in a lot of sense, it was just noise because at the end of the day, that wealth generationally down the road, way past me and my kids is going to be still measured in dollars. So what is the what is the high risk in that? And that's when I started looking instead of the strategies and the complex lingo of Wall Street, which by this point, 2015, 2016, I was pretty fluent in. And I just started thinking about basic questions like what is money and um, and, and what is how do you really measure risk in that regard? And I started looking at politics and I started looking at central banks more carefully, not just for tailwinds and headwinds for stocks or bonds, but really what are they doing to our money? At the end of the day, it's the thing that no one wants to look at, like debt, no one wants to look at currencies. I always joke, we spend most of our time with these fancy degrees and these credentials, like the passengers on the A deck of the Titanic, just I'm gonna have foie gras, I'm gonna have confit canard, I'm gonna have this for dessert, I'm gonna have this opryon, I'm gonna have this champagne, but they're ignoring the, the iceberg right off the bow. To me, it's a debt iceberg and it's a currency crisis coming. And it may not, I may not, no one really knows when that sovereign debt crisis is going to occur, or when that fiat system is going to have its, its day in the sun or its day in the dark, really, its day of reckoning. Although I don't know when it is, I know it's an iceberg. And so rather than worry about what I'm going to order on the menu, which hedge fund or which asset class is sexy today, and there are plenty of things that are sexy and not sexy, I'm just thinking about preserving wealth. At that point in my life, it was wealth preservation. I have nothing against speculation and those who want to play speculators and those who understand Keltner bands and Bollinger bands and, and, and those who know how to use options and can handle volatility, great. And there are plenty who can do it well. Most don't, but some can. But for me, being a speculator was not my personal priority. It was about wealth preservation. And that's when I started investing in gold. And that's when I met Egon von Greyers. I started out as an investor and then I became a partner. Because Egon, like me, came from a background, he was more of a banker and he was the head of a FTSE 100 company. He had done very well. He invested the bulk of his money, which to me was always concentration risk, but he invested the bulk of his money uh, when, you know, early when gold was at $300, you know, in the 2000s, early 2000s. And he was farsighted. He certainly understood how markets worked and how banks worked because he came from that world. But his simple, stupid solution was very elegant. I joke, it's like a Chanel dress or a glass of water or a baguette. When you're hungry, a baguette is great. When you're thirsty, water does just fine. And I've always said a Chanel dress, a black, simple dress always looks good. And to me, gold was that simple solution to wealth preservation. Again, I think gold will go up in speculative prices eventually. It certainly can. But it really is a constant. Well, currencies are getting weaker, whether it's the dollar, although relatively stronger than other currencies, well, currencies are getting weaker. Gold is a constant. I trust it far more than central bankers, certainly more than politicians, be they in Canada or the U.S. or elsewhere in the European community. 
it simply has stood the test of time. And when Nixon welched on the gold standard in 71, the inherent purchasing power of the dollar, like the Canadian dollar or the euro or the Swiss franc even, if you look at the simple stupid graph of the purchasing power of a, of a, of a sovereign fiat currency versus a milligram of gold, all the major currencies in the world, since the gold standard was taken away and they could print or produce money with unfettered exuberance, uh, all those currencies have lost greater than 98% of their purchasing power measured against gold. So it was, a, it was an aha moment, and it wasn't a coincidence that Egon created Matterhorn not just as a place to buy physical gold to act as insurance against currencies that are openly dying. Literally, it's like life insurance or auto insurance or home insurance or health insurance. Gold to me was an insurance asset. But in addition to understanding the importance of physical gold, you have to understand the risk in banks, which Egon saw 20 plus years ago, banking risk, fractured banking, consolidated banking, counterparty risk in banking, counterparty risk in the intermediaries of those banks that hold the gold and lever the gold or store the gold. So owning gold in a too big to fail bank wasn't safe. So I learned not only how and why to buy gold, but where to buy and store gold. And so, you know, again, from going to an investor, to a commercial director, to a partner, uh, Egon and I joke, we're like looking into the mirror. We have very, very similar views on the longer term historical play of physical gold as a wealth preservation asset. And yes, you can make other kinds of bigger returns speculating other assets if you know what you're doing or the manager of your money knows what they're doing. But for us, we have a very niche business, physical gold as wealth preservation insurance against currencies that are openly dying, stored in a jurisdiction outside of the banking system. And that speaks volumes to me at this point where I'm past scrutinizing, like I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly of those fancy hedge fund managers, many of whom are wonderful, most of whom aren't. And uh, that's just been my personal experience. I've, I've met with hundreds of them and, and, and really the big ones too. And most of them uh, taught me a lot. In fact, one of them gave me a book on gold and the French in the 1780s about how they destroyed their dollar or their assignon or their currency through money printing, which was very similar to QE1 through 4. I read that in 2014. That too was an aha moment. But again, I have nothing... Uh, I don't need to disparage other asset classes or disparage other strategies for those who understand market risk and risk assets or even cryptos. I'm absolutely fine with that. For me and for the clients that we have from over 90 countries all around the world, the great deal of AUM in Switzerland, our focus is very simple. It's an insurance product. It's a wealth preservation product. And we don't really look at the movement of price in gold every day. It certainly has been trending up since Egon bought it at 300. It can be volatile. But there is in my mind and in Egon's mind and all of our partners' minds, it's it's we don't have to worry about timing the market. We can very calmly be patient. Some people say it requires a monk's patience, but um, we know that debt crises are inevitable. We've seen a bunch already in the last couple of years which we can talk about. And we know that fiat currencies always revert to their paper value, which is zero. And that sounds sensational, but it's really not. It's literally the evidence is all around us. And so. Gold can move up and down with uh, fluctuations in the COMEX market, the LBNA market, the, the mechanizations that go on there every day at 2.30 with the boot to the neck and the permanent short. But we know there's massive risk in the, uh, in the derivatives market. We know there's massive risk in the sovereign bond market. We know things are breaking already. They're going to continue to break. And gold doesn't rise. Currencies just embarrass themselves. They just get weaker. It's a long answer to how I found my way from hedge funds to gold, but that's, that's how I got there. No, but, but, but great. Really appreciate all of that detail. And you mentioned in a recent interview that you're an American patriot, but you're not happy with the way the country, the policies, and the currency are going. I wonder if this is all baked in the cake, so to speak. You, you mentioned you know, the, the dollar coming off of a gold backing in 71. Some people even point to way back when the Federal Reserve was first created that since then it's all been kind of baked in this this system that you speak of, this in, these inevitable debt crises. Um, so what what is your view there? And do you see any of the same problems that you're seeing in America, in Europe as well? Yeah, look, I am, I am very patriotic and very pro-American, especially about the, the principles the principles and the founding ideals, which really came from France and then through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment came to the U.S. Um, our founding fathers, who were flawed but yet idealistic, had certain ideas about free speech, uh, free markets. Um, and I think um, I believed in those as a student. I still believe in them early on as, a, as an investor. And then I started to see things and understand things differently. As I said, when I started to understand money and central banks. 
And again, it's not conspiracy theory. That word is cheap. It's too easy. Um, I believe in what Kennedy said about profiles and courage, that there are a few, very few uh, politicians and policymakers from the Fed to the House of Representatives who actually care about their country more than re-election. Although I find that to be less and less the case with each generation. Uh, I wrote a book called Rigged to Fail in 2019 that goes into the history of the Federal Reserve. And it's not, again, smoke and mirror, conspiracy theory, banking cabal. It's a fact. It's a fact that a central bank is an absolute anathema to free price discovery, natural supply and demand. It's a fact that the antitrust rules that I studied in law school, which I thought the Department of Justice was there to protect, have been completely eradicated. There are robber barons in the U.S. worse than there was in any other time in the history. And our wealth disparity because of central bank policy is worse. And in our in our book with Egon von Greyers, and it's called Gold Matters, we talk a little bit about this evolution of this central bank. You really can't underestimate enough where that really is, where things really start to go wrong. We've gone in and out of a gold standard during wars and periods of debt where we needed to unchaperone our money from gold because we need to create more of it and inflate it and debase it. But when you look even prior to 1910, when these bankers met on Jekyll Island, you literally can't make it up. It's Shakespearean. They literally met with secret names from a train in Hoboken to go down to Jekyll Island and basically get away with creating a conspiracy, literally, to uh, to control the banking system. And, and, and then you look at 1913 when it was signed into law and Woodrow Wilson regretted it for the rest of his life, whatever that was and however sane or insane he was towards the end of it. Or however, he was more like a Joe Biden towards the end. He was just not there. But it was a dark time in our history. And this was something that Hamilton and Jefferson warned and debated about. This is something Andrew Jackson, again, old dead white men, all kinds of flaws. They may have owned a lot of bad values, but their fundamental principles of money and sound money, I think, are worth still remembering. They shouldn't be canceled. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, everyone knows, warned about a central bank being worse than a foreign army. Andrew Jackson said it is the prostitution of our financial system for the benefit of the few at the expense of the many. That was in, in 1852. Uh, 1832, excuse me, those centuries old warnings are literally coming home to roost now. When the central bank became real, it didn't prevent in 1913, it didn't prevent the crash of 1929. It didn't prevent subsequent crashes. It certainly didn't prevent the flash crash of 87 or 2008. In fact, in many ways, it was responsible for them. So the central bank, I think people need to, to look at more carefully. You're not a kook if you don't trust how an independent um, non-political building, which is on Constitutional Ave and is called a Federal Reserve, which is neither federal nor reserve. It is a very dark, dark story in American history. It is an, it is an insult to everything our Constitution said about the printing of money or the creation of money or the control of money. It is an insult, I think, to, again, free price discovery, natural supply and demand when you can mouse click money to support a bond market that is otherwise over its skis in debt. It's dishonest. It has far too much control. It is the market today. We talk about capitalism. I've written many times that capitalism died a long time ago, not just in 2008. It probably died in 1913. But the idea of giving this much power to a private bank uh, is appalling and it is against the very notion of capitalism. And then to have it really making financial policy and what we're supposed to have three branches of government, you know, the legislative, executive, judicial, we have a fourth branch that has more control now over our fates and that's an independent central bank. It is, it is as, as you look at it more carefully and you see what it's done to capitalism, you see what it's doing to currencies, uh, that is shocking as you get more and more aware. I mean, look, I went to Ivy League schools. I went to a good law school. I'm not a kook. I don't sit down in my mother's basement doing Google searches. It's just there for anyone to see. I think that was a turning point, certainly 2000, or 1913, 2008, 2020 turning points with central bank unlimited QE. I think also obviously the major turning point was 1971 when Nixon pre-Watergate Nixon, doing what all politicians do, thinking more about himself than the good of the country, wanted to get reelected, knew there was some financial stress coming into the election time, needed to spend more money, couldn't do it with the gold standard, took the dollar off the gold standard so he could buy time and buy votes. And of course, later he went down in flames with, with Watergate. But again, that was an example of political self-interest at the expense of the many as Jackson, as Andrew Jackson warned, it's too tempting. It's too seductive for every president, every regime, red or blue, 
When there's a debt ceiling, we can extend and pretend. When we need more money to stay elected to buy votes, or in Bernanke's case, buy a Nobel Prize, you can always gain friends by mouse clicking money and buying more time while ignoring that debt iceberg we talked about, by ignoring the fundamentals. And then when things break, break and go to hell, blame it on an extraneous event like COVID, or blame it on Putin, or blame it on environmental problems, but never ever take accountability. The, the, the lack of accountability, when I see Yellen or Powell in front of the Senate, not to mention how uninformed someone like Janet Yellen, a former Fed chair and now a secretary of the Treasury, really is on the debt reality, either, either ignorant or disingenuous. Neither one is good enough for me. And again, red or blue, I see the same thing. So those are all watershed moments that, yes, I'm a patriot, but any patriot, including the signers of the Declaration of Independence, warn when your government is no longer honest, when your government is no longer transparent, when it no longer serves the mass of the people, but only a small minority of people, which wealth inequality post-2008 has made abundantly clear that the Fed has created no trickle-down effect. Even in my wealth category, the top percentages, it's not good for any country to see this type of wealth disparity. It creates resentment, it builds social unrest, it's solved by more control, more centralization, whether it's a central bank, whether it's centralized digital currencies, central bank digital currencies, whether it's so-called censorship for national security, whether it's forced mandates. All these things are signs of more and more distance between our fundamental principles, the things I studied in law school, the things I studied as an undergrad, the men who made this country great, dead white men. I'm sorry they all are, and some of them own slaves, and that's a problem, but we can't cancel the wisdom of some of their insights. That shouldn't be canceled. And we can't look for perfection in everything, but we can certainly find financial, philosophical, and governmental principles that are completely disappearing now at our DOJ, at our central bank, at our house of representatives. So like you, I was appalled. I'm appalled to see the disconnect from what freedom really means, what free markets really mean, what supply and demand really means. And I think to be a patriot, whether you live overseas or between the US and Europe or wherever you come from, to be a patriot, you have to be informed and critical. That doesn't make you a threat to national security. That doesn't make you a kook. That doesn't make you a fascist. That doesn't make you dishonest. It means you're scratching your head and you want more accountability. You want more transparency. You want open debate by informed participants, not emotional debate or social justice platforming where you can easily say the right things, stay safe in your job, stay safe in your position, stay safe in your post but not even know what you're talking about or be sincere and not be able to have even, a, I mean, you saw RFK and having a debate with some doctor some about COVID. Look, both could be right, but why can't they debate? Why is one afraid to have a debate? Why did we not have that debate before these things happened? Again, not gonna get on a sidetrack about this watershed event that was COVID, but there was no public debate. And I think there's a temptation when countries go deeper and deeper into debt and they're clearly embarrassed and they're clearly heading towards that iceberg, whether that's a month, a quarter or five years down the road, they see it coming. That always leads to more centralized control, which is why folks like Trudeau or Klaus Schwab, both of whom are openly acknowledging their envy of guys like Xi in China, because Xi has control. He doesn't have to worry about silly things like democratic elections or the will of the people. Xi can just do what he wants. That's an advantage. Napoleon had that advantage. Others have had that advantage. It works to some extent, but it isn't democracy. I think folks like Trudeau and the mandates and what we saw in the U.S. was really, uh, it was really, it was really a form of control masquerading as what's best for the people, what's best for democracy. They use these words like liberty, democracy, freedom. But it was really a fear campaign to control. And again, very debatable, should be debated. People can take or leave what I say and debate me. I'd have to do it. But I'm not an expert on biology and I'm not an expert on what goes behind the scenes and who really makes the decisions for Biden or what Trudeau really thinks or where he really comes from. What I do know in terms of the financial world, which I am, I think, more informed of, it is clearly not a transparent uh, system. It is clearly not a natural system. It is clearly tilting more and more towards control. It is absolutely rigged when you understand how the central banks and the too big to fail bank works and how they use interest on excess reserves and how they bail each other out. But we've also seen cracks in that system because any system, no matter how corrupt, which I think it is, or how rigged I think it is, ultimately the markets have more power than even desperate policymakers. Everyone we've seen since Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen, Powell, or certainly at the ECB and at the Bank of England, all their F efforts to postpone and stall the inevitability of what happens when you're in too much debt will fail. And they are failing. We've seen cracks in the ice, obviously, when the COVID crisis hit and markets lost faith. 
Markets were heading towards 60, 70 percent corrections. They printed trillions, trillions in a matter of 13 to 14 months. They rebought time at the expense of the currency, but they kept that market alive artificially. Then, of course, in 2022, when we weaponized the world reserve currency, even John Maynard Keynes said, don't weaponize a world reserve currency. Barack Obama warned against that in 2015. You can do that with Iran and Venezuela. You can't do that with Russia is in bed already with China and is already making deals with the BRICS. So we're seeing watershed policy mistakes driven by this desire to keep things centralized and to compete financially. We have a financial cold war right now with Russia and China. We have a hot war in the Ukraine, which I think is just the U.S. using Ukraine as a battering ram to, to punish Putin for other things. So it's like so many wars and so many policies where the U.S. comes in and promises freedom. If you look at the track record of our Operation Freedoms and our wars for freedom, they haven't gone so well. I know a lot of men and women, mostly men, who fought in many of those wars, better men than me, better people than me. But I've always said they're, they're lions, lions being led by donkeys. So everything I see from politics to censorship to financial leadership, it is like the JV, not the varsity players. It is the lower 10% of the class making decisions while the smarter kids are either being censored or left out or ignored. And we have to find alternative platforms. Not even Jamie Dimon speaks transparently, certainly not Powell. And everyone I talk to, whether it's Alistair McLeod or Brent Johnson or anyone, Ronnie Sturfler, we all know that the smartest guys in the rooms aren't the guys at the Fed or the ECB or the Bank of England. They're the most credentialed and usually the ones who have no choice but to toe a line. And I think for for investors, you have to be very careful, very selective, including listening to me or Egon or anyone else. You know, find people that resonate with you who are at least telling the truth, not necessarily the truth, but the honest opinions. And I think that's where investors have to be more selective now, uh, finding the voice that resonates with them, finding the data that resonates with them, uh, finding the style of investing that resonates with them. But at the very least, have someone tell you their honest views and not be constrained by a board of directors at a bank or by a hiring committee at the Fed, or by a House of Representatives where you're looking to be reelected. What we need are more people uh, speaking out against the obvious elephants in the room right now, which is a debt crisis and a currency crisis. I don't even think that's an opinion anymore. I think it's just, there's neon flashing signs of that all around us. And how do you prepare for that? How do you react to that? We can't necessarily convene and, and, and and, and grab pitchforks, but we can think independently and critically. And it goes back to your question. Being a patriot means being critical and holding the quote unquote, your representatives to the task. But when you understand even how the Congress works with the lobbying on K Street, and for every member of Congress there's four lobbyists from the financial or tech industry, that's not representative democracy as we envisioned in 1776 or 1787. That is not what we had in mind with free markets, not even what Hamilton or Jefferson or debating had in mind. What we have now is a centralized rigged system. We have wealth inequality like we've never seen it before. We don't have open debate. We don't have transparency. We never get accountability from our central bankers or politicians. Rarely in the US have I ever seen a central banker. I know there was one in, I think it was in Australia or somewhere else who said, look, I'm sorry for this policy. I think we screwed that up. But you won't hear that from Powell or, or Bernanke. I think what you'll hear from Bernanke is congratulating himself for a Nobel Prize for what, printing trillions of dollars? I think that's not exactly brilliant to solve a problem. And I think Powell's decision to fight inflation by engineering a recession is not exactly brilliant. And I think you keep have to ask yourself behind every major crisis, 87, 2003 in the NASDAQ, obviously 2008, 2020 with the COVID crisis in the fall there, 2022 with the sanctions, behind every major crisis, where the Fed supposedly saves you. No one's asking the forensics of how we got in that crisis. And it was the Fed. It was playing with matches with interest rates and thinking they could control markets like you control a thermostat in your house by dialing up and down the liquidity or the quantitative easing or tightening or manipulating interest rates. Interest rates are ultimately determined by the bond market, not a central banker. And we'll, we'll see that. And people ask when, I don't know. We've seen so many cracks in 2019 with the repo crisis, that should have been headlines for weeks, should have been debated, discussed and made clear. It's very complex, reverse repo and repo markets. But that was the first real sign that the ice was cracking. 2020, obviously the COVID crisis, when we printed trillions and we created that much liquidity so fast, that should have been discussed. What are the ramifications of that? 2022, the guilt crisis, obviously in the UK, massive event in sovereign credit markets should have been discussed for weeks, debated, making the headlines, but the average citizen has no clue what those implications are. And then of course, 2023, regional bank failures. You know, what was it? Uh, you know, I think 10 years ago, we had 14,000 uh, small banks in America. Now we have about 5,000. This again should be discussed. Why? What's happening? Why would the Fed 
raise rates into a world where they know regional banks which hold U.S. Treasuries as collateral. Those rates are going to push those bond prices down. It's going to squeeze regional banks. It's my opinion, just an opinion. This is all part of a deliberate plan to consolidate the big banks and to squeeze out the little banks. Again, not free market capitalism because the Fed determines those rates, not natural markets. And I think eventually you're going to see a small handful of banks essentially as branch offices of the only bank that matters in the U.S., which is the U.S. Federal Reserve. And again, I'll remind reader, listeners that the last time you had a central bank that did all the banking for a country was in the Soviet Union. That's hardly liberté, égalité, fraternité. That's hardly freedom and democracy of America. We're simply a shadow of our former self, financially, politically, uh, and policy-wise. And again, I know that sounds anti-American. I still think America can be and was and should be one of the greatest countries in the world, and certainly in history. It started off with really beautiful ideas. But human beings have a way of destroying their ideas when they elect the wrong people or the wrong people come into power. Yeah, and I think it really is a question of, you know, the, your average person on the street has no idea that any of this is going on. And I counted myself among those people not so long ago. It was actually the pandemic and the policies that were implemented and everything going on that kind of woke me up and um, made me realize something doesn't seem right. I wasn't even really paying attention to what my political leaders were doing before that. So, you know, I think it did wake a lot of people up, but I, I think there's there's still a long ways to go because when you start talking to a member of the general public about, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve being formed on Jekyll Island in 1913 and about reverse repo markets and all this different stuff, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, but I think more people are educating themselves. So, so that is a good thing. Um, I wanted to know what you think about gold's role in all of this. And I wanted to point to an article recently written by Charles Gave, where he believes in the coming geopolitical and monetary shift that gold will be the key instrument in trading between the Asian, US and European zones as the US dollar ceases to be the main currency of international trade. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Are we headed to this sort of de-dollarization scenario? Yeah, I've written and spoken a lot about de-dollarization. It started the day after the sanctions began in, uh, in, you know, in early Q1 of, or Q1 of March of 2022. And again, I wasn't alone. Uh, Grant Williams and many others immediately said what we just saw by weaponizing the U.S. dollar, freezing FX reserves, uh, cutting off access to SWIFT and SDR access to a major power like Russia. Once you do that, you can never put the genie back in the bottle. And, and as Grant said, Grant Williams said, uh, and, and I parroted immediately, is, um, that was probably as big a watershed moment in March of 2022 in terms of currencies and countries trusting each other's currencies as August of 1971 when Nixon welched on the gold standard. Because remember, from 1944, America promised to be a gold-backed dollar. Every country bought dollars or bought treasuries with dollar bases trusted that dollar, not because they trusted the current regime, because they trusted gold. And when, when Nixon welched on that, that was a turning point on how the world looked at the dollar. That's why de Gaulle sent a boat into New York to get his gold out of the U.S., because this is no longer a trusted currency. And then in 2022, when we weaponized that currency against a major power, frenemies, enemies, and even allies of the U.S., including France, started to raise an eyebrow and say, what is this U.S. dollar? Again, in a more political way than I did when I was looking at as a portfolio manager, what is its inherent purchasing power? Countries started to ask, what is, what is its trustworthiness? And that began the process of obvious de-dollarization. It was a long, long-hoped excuse for Russia and China to begin the process they've been looking for a pretext for for years, which is to slowly de-dollarize. And I want to distinguish de-dollarization from the end of the U.S. dollars of world reserve currency. It's a two different things. I don't see that happening anytime soon. I agree with Brent Johnson a lot on a lot of things, and I certainly agree with him on that, that we're not seeing the end of the dollar or the total debasement of the dollar because there is a lot of demand for that dollar still in the derivative markets, in the euro dollar markets, and it is still the best horse in the glue factory in a lot of ways. But what we are seeing is a major shift in the trust and in the future direction of the U.S. dollar as a trade settlement currency. And you're going to see in August of this year, the BRIC countries are going to meet in South Africa. But it's not just it's not just Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It's also Iran, Saudi Arabia. It's also France and India. There's 20 other countries. It's the BRICS plus. That cannot be ignored. Again, that doesn't mean the end of the U.S. dollar that's going to go to disappear or that's going to be left behind or that its reserve currency status is going to disappear. We are clearly seeing an irreversible trend. When the dollar was king and the Fed raised rates, this was even before the sanctions, 
And the Fed is raising rates on that dollar at five, you know, massive warp speed in a short amount of time to fight inflation. Well, every country that had trillions of dollars in dollar of debt, over 14 trillion all around the world, West, East, South, emerging, developing, that owed dollar denominated debt just got gut punched because now the cost of that debt got more expensive. They're already tired of being slaves to the U.S. dollar. And then we weaponized that dollar not long after, and then they didn't trust it for other reasons. So that combination of raising rates in a world that has to pay back dollar denominated debt, that hurt. That upset the world. And then when you weaponize that dollar against an enemy, whether you're for or against the war in Ukraine, and that's a whole other like COVID debate that's not worth getting into, but regardless of whether you're for or against it, by weaponizing the dollar, as Obama warned, and Biden clearly, whoever he is, forgot, that's going to create uh, ripple effects that you can't control. And so what's happening now is, again, not the end of the world reserve currency, not the end of the U.S. dollar, but a clear shift Um and, and, you know, the BRICs are working on creating some kind of basket of currencies aggregated. They're going to be backed by real assets for that to have credibility. Even among the BRICs, they don't all trust each other or their currencies. But for that to have credibility, there has to be some partial coverage in real assets like gold. And I think, you know, in other countries, like you've seen the Kenyan president and the Brazilian president, why are we forced to pay for everything in dollars? We need to pay in our own currencies. Again, very patriotic for those local countries, Brazil, Kenya. But Let's be honest, Brazil and Kenya don't have the most reputation for normal government or non-corrupt governments or safe currencies. So to Brent Johnson's point, yes, there's a whole movement away from the dollar and distrust of the dollar. But are you going to replace that with the rupee? Are you going to replace it with the yuan tomorrow or the ruble? It's not going to happen. But what is happening for these countries that are tired of the U.S. dollar, of, an, of importing U.S. inflation, of being forced to pay things in U.S. dollar terms, or even to buy oil in U.S. dollar terms? Because, you know, you're seeing countries now, uh, I think India, uh, Argentina is now importing Chinese goods and paying it in yuan, not in dollars. You're seeing far more, and even India is, is buying oil outside the U.S. dollar. Saudi Arabia is certainly considering selling oil outside of the petrodollar. So there's clearly a move where the dollar is losing its trust and its hegemony. And I think that, again, comes to the gold question for regardless of where the, the world goes slowly but surely. And as the BRICS meet in, 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 in South Africa this August, and as Russian prime ministers like uh, Glasiev and Bobolkov are coming up with a new trade settlement that's backed by gold, they're doing that for a number of reasons. A, because they're tired of the U.S. dollar being the biggest bully, the biggest fiat bully. And, and B, because they know for them to build an alternative system, an alternative trade system, to have any credibility and trust, even among themselves, even among those that are tired of the U.S. dollar, Brazil, Russia, China, India, they may like each other right now because they have a common foe in the dollar, but they don't really trust each other. And for them to trust each other, this is something David Frisbee and Alistair McLeod talked about when I was in Frankfurt. For them to really trust each other, they trust the gold. They may, regimes come and go, but if you've got the gold, that's where the trust is. That's no coincidence why Russia and China are stacking gold and dumping U.S. treasuries. Again, this doesn't mean next week the dollar's gone, gold goes to 20,000 or 5,000 or 10,000. It just means that there is a seismic shift, as Grant Williams and I talked about last year, of moving away from the dollar. And to Brent Johnson's point, that dollar still has massive absorption power, massive uh, demand from the derivative market, from the euro dollar market. And, and Brent Johnson would say, there's going to be moments where, like me, he agrees that there's a sovereign debt crisis coming. There's no doubt that's coming. What we've seen so far with the gilt market, with the repo markets, with the, the regional banks, is just the tip of the iceberg. More things are going to break. In fact, I think the pause we have right now by the Fed is just to give banks a breather. More things are going to break. And when they do, what Brent Johnson says is they're going to go to the U.S. dollar. It's still, again, the, the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry or the best horse in the glue factory. And the dollar could spike even more. I think that's a very fair point. He could be right. I disagree to some extent. I think it's very possible that the dollar will peak higher. But I think what really the U.S. government needs is a weaker dollar. Ultimately, they're going to want to pivot. They're going to want to print, not just to bail out the bond market. They got to print money so they can monetize those U.S. treasuries so that the yields don't get too high and the, and the, and the yields don't spike. They want to print money because we know we're going into a recession. They're going to need to buy time and buy buy support, by getting growth through printed money. And I also think they're going to compete with China by weakening the U.S. dollar eventually. That's my view, because the U.S. system can either choose between saving the system and being more competitive or saving the dollar. And they're going to let the dollar fall on the sword, in my opinion. They don't want the dollar to get too strong. That happened to them in the 80s with Japan. Their best way to fight Japan and the rising sun was to 
basically make the Japanese yuan strong and the dollar, or the Japanese yen strong and the dollar weaker. There was a deliberate policy to weaken the dollar to beat Japan. I think it'll be very similar with China. They're going to weaken the dollar to beat China long term. They're going to weaken the dollar to monetize their U.S. treasuries, and they're going to weaken the dollar to inflate their way out of a debt bubble. They're going to let the they're going to let the currency die to save the system. In the meantime, to Brett Johnson's point, maybe we'll see the dollar spike as a flow a flow into the U.S. dollar as a safe haven, which is an ironic word for the U.S. dollar, but it is still the whole world's fiat as of now. But I still think they're going to they're going to longer term see the dollar tank, and I think gold can rise in a weaker, strong dollar position. But when the gold price really beats the U.S. dollar, because everyone measures gold in the dollar, even though if you owned gold in other currencies, you saw how much how um, powerfully important that was and still important for the dollar. But when that finally breaks, that's when you're going to see gold really take off in terms of speculation and price moves. In the meantime, gold does its job very well, just preserving the purchasing power of that dollar. But I see longer term, a weaker dollar as the real politic. You know, it's the cost of our sins. We've been printing and printing. We're addicted to it. Our markets are addicted to it. Our treasury markets are addicted to it. Our stock markets are addicted to it. And ultimately to compete internationally in trade, we're going to need a weaker dollar. All that falls into play perfectly. There's either that or the Great Reset, some new, you know, you know Plaza Accord, Bretton Woods 2.0 that the IMF. We'll, we'll have to see. But no matter what, there's there's pain ahead, regardless of what the S&P or the NASDAQ does this year, this month or last year. I mean, we went from a horrible year last year to a, a better year this year in risk assets only because the markets have priced in a pause or a pivot. They're, they're, they're front running the Fed. They think this, this hawkish uh, pause that Powell promises to raise later is really an end to rate hikes. And so they're expecting a pivot. So they're already cranking up on the risk asset side of the markets and going long. Some hedge funds are just sitting in two year treasuries because they'd rather get four and a half percent yield or more than take a risk on the S&P. We'll see who's right or wrong. There'll always be people buying dips and chasing tops. I think QE, the next QE won't have quite the same punch in a world of sticky inflation, underreported, misreported, but there nevertheless. So there's so many things happening right now that are fascinating. Uh, Brent Johnson, I respect, he could be right. Dollar could hit all time highs. Um, or we could just see a, a, an uh-oh moment that results in weakening dollars. I think we'll probably see a lot of both, to be honest. But the end result, the ultimate trend for me is a much weaker dollar. And I think 10, 20 years down, I'm thinking of my kids and grandkids with the money that I have. And our investors are the same. We're, we're not speculators with gold. And frankly, gold can make massive moves up or down. It's relatively stable now. We have a flagpole technical formation. And others like Francis Hunt see it at 2,900. I, I really don't. I'm kind of agnostic. I just know that I don't trust that fiat currency at all. And uh, physical gold is as a wealth preservation asset, not a speculative asset. If you're looking for huge risk, huge reward, you know, jump into the crypto side, go, go, you know, go long or short some NASDAQ names because the S&P and the NASDAQ are driven by eight or nine names, not 500 or 100. So you give a great presentation at the German Gold Show in May, and I want to hone in on one section where the slide was titled Bond Markets Rising Rates into an Unprecedented Debt Bubble Equals Tomorrow's Commodity Pleasure. Can you walk us through that concept? Yeah, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Commodities are the most unloved asset class for a long time. Uh, certainly the mining stocks and other commodities, even natural gas and oil are down. Um, and this was kind of reminded me of a chart that Ronnie Sturfer came out with earlier in the year, the chart of the decade, which shows the relationship between the S&P and commodities. So when the S&P is ripping or the risk assets are ripping, the opportunity cost of commodities is too high. No one wants to be in there. What I said in that slide, what I was trying to imply, and it's my view, is um, right now we have the greatest debt bubble in history, not just nationally, but globally. I mean, we all know that U.S. public debt is $32 trillion, but combined public household and corporate debt is well over 95 trillion. Then you add in unfunded liabilities and the derivative markets and you're talking abstract numbers. I call it the banalization of money. It's like the banalization of evil, the banalization of debt. It's like Hannah rent. It's so beyond, it's like the Holocaust. You can't even conceive of the numbers. The debt is just there. No one's looking at it. I understand it's Alstein, Algen, Alstein, Sin out of sight out of mind. No one wants to see that. It's no fun at a party. It's no fun when your portfolio is ripping and a guy like me shows up and says, yeah, I just, I just own gold, you know. Why? Because I'm really, really nervous. Well, I've been saying that for years, Matt. We don't want to hear it. But I think these are just obvious realities. And, and it requires a lot of patience and confidence. And I understand that's hard when there's opportunity cost and, and, and speculation. People can, can do that. But when I see that much debt, and then I see interest rates rising, you know, to fight inflation, which is a whole other conversation, but it's the perfect storm. 
It really is. When when debt is what solves the American problem, we don't get it through tax receipts. We don't get it through GDP anymore. We don't get it through manufacturing. The American dream is now made in China. You can blame that on Clinton, the WTO. We said, hey, all our blue jeans and all our toasters are going to be bought by the Chinese. They forgot to tell you that the Chinese are going to be making those blue jeans and toasters as well. So we sold ourselves out. CEOs in America wanted cheaper labor in China. We crushed the Rust Belt states. We crushed American productivity. That was a self-inflicted wound, not even by the Fed. That was by greedy CEOs in the C-suites. Because if you can bring your margins into control by having cheap labor, it's just another form of slavery in China, really cheap labor. And Nike and others are guilty of that. So it's not just the Fed. There's some pretty pretty greedy, un-American, unpatriotic CEOs who outsource all their labor, mostly to China, in some cases, South or Central America. But I'm saying that we have all this debt. We don't survive through manufacturing. We don't survive through tax receipts unless the stock market is ripping. We need to keep that stock market alive. We're not doing it through, through GDP, so we're going to need more debt. We're going to need to issue more IOUs. But those IOUs are getting more and more expensive and less and less loved. So that is a perfect scenario, in my opinion, and I don't know when. I cannot time it. I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, frankly. It could be three years from now. It could be by the end of this, uh, end of this year, Q1 of 2024. No one knows. But I do know that when I look at this horizon, I see nothing but lightning and nothing but building storm clouds. I need to get an umbrella. Something's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to rain. It's going to rain. And this debt bubble, this combination of unloved sovereign bonds and rising rates is going to break something big at some point. And when that does, markets, equity and bond, which are driven by liquidity, liquidity is the thing. Without liquidity, the whole system dries up and dies. When there's less liquidity and too much cracking and not enough buyers, they're going to have to print money to keep that liquidity going. In the meantime, markets are going to tank and risk assets are meant to have constructive destruction. That's normal capitalism. We postpone that. But when that happens, I don't know when it will. All markets revert to the mean, even Fed supported, ECB supported artificial markets that aren't capitalism. When they bust, um, well, that's when commodities in general and gold and silver in particular really rip. And so that takes very, very strong contrarian confidence in cycles. Many worry that the Fed has outlawed, outlawed those cycles. And I can respect that because technically, Monetary modern theory is correct. You can avoid any kind of market crash by printing enough money. But if you do that, you have to print money out of nowhere. That means you're debasing the money. When you debase money and you debase the inherent purchase power at the levels necessary in the next five to 10 years, commodity prices are going to rip just by the debasement of the currency. And so you'll see a cycle with risk assets go down. Again, don't know when, don't know what the trigger will be. You would think of regional bank failure might have been one, but they, they plug that gap pretty quickly for now. But when that happens, commodities are going to rip. And, and, and again, you got to have an allocation to commodities in general. But I think in particular, gold and silver will do extremely well just because they're, they're monetary metals, gold in particular. And so that was what I meant by that slide. You've got debt at un, unprecedented levels colliding with rising rates. Again, remember when Paul Volcker tried to fight inflation, U.S. public debt was about 800, 900 billion, not 32 trillion. So Volcker could raise rates to fight inflation. He wasn't looking down the barrel of 32 trillion in Uncle Sam IOUs and Uncle Sam debt. So for 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 Powell to compare himself to Volcker is again, I think Ronnie Sturp is like Danny DeVito comparing himself to Brad Pitt. It's simply not comparable. It's apples to oranges. So that's what I meant by that slide. And again, that's simple, stupid. That's not complex derivative training. That's not, you know, fancy Greek math and all the stuff I had to learn later, which is really shows how smart you are, but not how wise you are. There's a difference. But keep it simple, stupid. Again, there's the deck, there's the menu at the restaurant and the Titanic, and there's the iceberg. Do you want to be an expert on wines on the Titanic? God bless you. Go into all the vintage years of all the Bordeaux and Bourgogne's, but just look at that iceberg. I'm much more interested now in the iceberg because it's just common sense and history. And I think anyone who wants to be informed about markets should start with debt start with interest rates, uh, start with the Fed. But I mean, you don't need to be in Wall Street. You don't need to be a lucky dot com or you don't need to be an executive in Switzerland. You just have to get informed. As Thomas Jefferson said, educate yourself. If, this, if the country won't do it, do it yourself. Be careful who you read. That means challenge who you read, challenge your own assumptions, challenge me. I challenge my own assumptions all the time. But inform yourself. The more you see this, it really comes down to very simple. The debt's too big. We can't pay it. We're going to have to monetize it. To do that, we're going to have to print. And uh, to print means we're going to debase the currency even more than it already is. It's already near zero. So it's so simple, stupid. And again, gold price moves, manipulation, derivative markets. I get all that. But gold is still far more loyal throughout, <laughs> throughout millennia 
than fiat money. I think it's just hard for people to imagine that tomorrow will be different than yesterday because they don't want to see it. And I, and I understand that. But I think there's more and more eyebrows being raised now for a lot of reasons. There's distrust at so many levels uh, that now even, even monetary policy needs to be understood uh, more carefully, I think. Aside from gold and silver, what are the commodities that you think will provide the greatest opportunity up ahead? Or is this pretty much an across the board commodities bull cycle incoming? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't really, and people will think this is blasphemy. Um, I kind of agree with Alistair McLeod. I really don't see silver as a monetary metal, although there are others who would strongly disagree and probably have a good argument. Um, silver will move 2x in either direction faster than gold up or down. And as Jim Rogers and others said, it's the trade. This is the trade, for, especially for speculators. Um, and also because of the industrial use of silver. And I think Chinese demand for silver as an industrial metal will also lead to a major tailwind. But when gold really rips as markets go under, uh, as gold really rips when whatever next trigger, there's so many needles pointed at this red debt balloon, whenever that trigger happens, there's going to be a major fall off in, in the markets and hence a major need for the Fed to QE into an inflationary backdrop that will create a huge, I think, natural demand pull for gold. As gold breaks 2000, 2500, 2900, silver will really be a great speculative asset, but it will also be an industrial asset. Copper, there's a lot of copper, but we're seeing in the comics, you know, the paper price of silver is a classic example. There's so much delivery now on the comics and silver because industries need the silver. And the industries are not even going to the comics, not even buying it there, holding it in comics vaults. They're just going right to the refineries. They're going right to the mines to get their silver. So you're seeing a massive dislocation in the paper price and the actual price and the actual demand for silver. And the truth is that demand is going to outstrip supply in silver very soon. That won't happen with copper. But in general, I think there'll just be a massive commodity cycle, which has been down for decades. And if you look at commodity cycles versus uh, risk asset cycles, again, I always joke, play where the hockey ball or hockey puck or the polo ball is three moves ahead or the chess move three moves ahead. I think it's very tempting, as I was in the 1990s, to pick a couple IPOs or to pick Nokia or Juniper or Yahoo and just go for it and, and try and get 17x <laughs> and, and think one stovepipe at a time. I think and there's look for young investors or any type of investor who wants to speculate and you love that rush, go for it. I, I don't have the stomach for it anymore. And I knew I was lucky and not smart. But now that I'm smart and I want to preserve money, it's a very different mindset. I play I play three moves ahead all the time now. I, I don't want to buy a top or a dip in this market. I don't trust it. Some people can play it better than me. I, I wouldn't touch it. But again, I've been I've been bearish since 2017, 2015, and I missed a lot of upside in the markets, but I never regretted buying gold. But I think Commodities are going to have their day in the sun. If you're thinking 10, 15 years ahead, you've got to start allocating dollar cost averaging the commodity indexes. But I think silver will do better than, say, copper in, in a commodity super cycle because there's, there's more supply of copper right now. It's everywhere than there is silver. But I think in general that, hell, even beef, I mean, pork bellies, you know, water, there are going to be things that are going to make more and more sense over the next 10, 15 years. That's too far ahead for many people right now. I understand that. I'm not the right person to listen to for specific sector advice today or specific stock picks. I mean, personally, I mean, we're talking markets. I, I, I've always made money shorting the fangs whenever I saw them overpriced. I still do that every now and then because I just see it, you know, and I, I know the fangs go where monetary policy goes. And I know cryptos go where the fangs go too. And there are 25,000 cryptos, but there's only a couple that you can trade up and down. I knew a guy who did nothing but go long and short Tesla for years because you could see them. You could see the technicals for people that can do that. That's fine. I, I'm really not in that mindset anymore. I'm, you know, in my fifties, you know, I'm trying to preserve what I have. And I want to be able to say with a straight face what I believe is something that I talked to someone 10 years from now that I gave them the advice to buy fiscal gold, that I won't be embarrassed as opposed to a particular stock. And that doesn't mean that gold can't go down. It doesn't mean that at all. There are many smart people who say when markets crash and they're gold, they're gold bulls. They're seriously pro gold. They say when markets crash, gold is very sympathetic like it was in 2008, 2009. It can go down. You can buy later. I don't look to buy. I just buy. I buy gold. I don't wait for posts. If you can buy gold, buy it. Because whatever it's going to be in 10 years, I'm quite confident. I'm not going to promise. I'm quite confident based on history, math, and common sense. It's going to be worth a lot more than your fiat currency. And that I just really believe. So um, I look at gold as a commodity that uh, that I'm not embarrassed to recommend at any time in the cycle. Yeah, better if you can buy it lower than somebody else. But at the end of the day, whether you bought it 1800 or 2000 or 2300 I think 10 years now won't really matter to most. Egon bought it at 300 He'll still buy it at 1800 or 2000 You just keep buying. And central banks, by the way, are buying gold too, physical gold. They're not buying crypto and they're not buying treasuries. They're dumping them. So 
that's just the, the, the hockey puck or the polo ball that I'm playing for the next, the next five moves. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, I, I think commodities in general are going to do well over the long term. It's hard to play them in the near term because certainly the miners and the commodity you know, indexes are getting beaten up. And I understand that's frustrating. But if you're an investor rather than a speculator and you have conviction, you just play the long game. You know, you just do. Uh, that's how I see it. Yeah, I love that long term mentality as well. And I think these days it's tough, you know, as Rick Rule likes to say, the average investor these days, is their time horizon is a long weekend. They want to know what's the hot stock to buy now, what junior miner that costs six cents is going to go to six dollars by the end of the year. Um, when you tell somebody 10 to 15 years, they, they generally tend to walk away. But but um, I'm all about a longer time horizon on this show. So I really appreciate that view. Um, well, look, thank you so much for joining us today, Matthew. Before I let you go, for those who want to learn more, could you tell us about Matterhorn Asset Management and Gold Switzerland? Yeah, um, you know, we're based out of Zurich and we, I joke, uh, I'm a landlord and an insurance salesman. So that is, I sell insurance for dying currencies. So we sell physical gold and silver uh, and uh, we hold it in the ground in the, in the safest vault in the world at an undisclosed location in the Swiss Alps. Um we, that's all we focus on. It's just that we're not, we certainly give advice on markets, but we don't provide brokerage service for anything but physical metals. We buy a lot of our gold directly through the refiners. Most of them are, 70% uh, of the best refiners are based in Zurich. Uh, the privacy laws are still better in Zurich than anywhere else. The vault we have, again, is the safest in the world. We do have a vault in Singapore and another one in Zurich uh, under the airport, very safe, uh, very sound. But we just believe in holding physical metal and we believe in holding it outside of the banking system. Thank God we see way too much counterparty risk. We don't believe in ETF or paper gold. So it's simple, stupid. Again, it's going back to that Chanel dress or that glass of water. It's uh, physical gold held outside of a banking system um, and really uh, with no counterparty risk because ultimately, you know, people say it's a pet rock. You throw it in the ground, it stares back at you and you have to pay a fee to hold it there. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a, it's a piece of metal that sits in the ground and stares back at you when you pay a fee for it. So we're landlords and we're insurance salesmen because we know that that gold um, is going to hold out better than the fiat currencies. We've got come, you know clients from over 90 countries, but our minimums are pretty high. We're not for the everyday investor, and that's fortunate or unfortunate depending on your operational perspective. Uh, we just don't have the manpower to do all retail gold. So our minimums for the Swiss vault location in the, in the Alps, which has its own private airstrip and lodging and high end, very white glove. That's $5 million minimum. And for the other vaults in Singapore and Zurich, it's 400,000 Swiss franc, US dollar equivalent. So, you know, we, we catered to serious gold investors, uh, institutional, private, family offices, trusts, et cetera. Uh, but it's uh, definitely the best service I think out there. We're the largest gold provider outside of the banking system for high net worths. Um, so many still feel safe with the JP Morgans and the Lombard ODAs in the peak days. We understand that, but we just don't trust banks long enough to hold our gold there. Great. Well, I'll put a link in the description to Gold Switzerland for anybody who wants to check that out. And thank you once again for joining us, Matthew, and sharing all of your knowledge with the audience. Well, it's my pleasure. Look forward to speaking again. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.